Testing. There it is. Hello, everybody. Did everybody get enough sleep? Ha, ha, ha. Oh, man. Brutal. You know, I think you could even go to bed an hour earlier, but still having to get up, the, you know, that hour just hits, and it's like, no. I, yeah. And so that's, we, we went to um, the Westwood Jubilation last night to watch uh, the students perform, uh, and they let Westwood perform last since they're home, and so they performed at 10 o'clock. Um, and, and so, you know, I was like, it's good. It's good. Um, it was a great time. The students did a fantastic job. Um, and so, and we are excited to be here this morning. We might be a little bit tired, um, but we're not going to let that keep us from worshiping our God this morning. So, um, some announcements uh, to go through this morning. If you're a first time guest with us, uh, if you would grab a Connect card in the chair in front of you and fill that out, and you can come find me in the foyer after service, uh, I'd love to meet you, um, get your name, and we use that card uh, to get you some information about the church. Uh, and some different things that we have going on. And those can also be used for prayer requests. And, um, and so if you have anything that you'd like prayers for, uh, we'd love to pray for you, um, with you. And, um, and if you would like, you can even mark on there that you'd like it shared on the prayer chain. And we'd love to get on the prayer chain so we can get even more people praying for you. Um, some other announcements. Uh, VBS. Uh, again, we are in full swing heading towards VBS. Um, on the table back there, um, on, just outside the door behind the window, um, is signups for help for volunteers. Um, and we, um, we, you know, we always need volunteers for VBS. Um, you know, I don't know if we've ever turned volunteers away. And so I would rather have that problem than not enough. And so um, please, please, please um, go sign up uh, for VBS. Even if you've never helped with the children's ministry, you've never helped with VBS, um, you know, the, the kiddos don't bite that hard. Um, and so it'll be okay. Uh, but no, uh, please do, please. Uh, uh, we would love the help. We'd love the... Um, to have that all set up, and we're also going to get uh, signups here for help um, for setup um, here going soon. Uh, April is the last month um, that we do Slam and Encounter, so we can spend the whole month of May um, doing VBS prep and getting stuff ready and getting decorations. You know, if you saw last year with all the crazy decorations that we had, the whole hallway of stars and whatnot, um, that's all done by hand. Um, that's all done by volunteers and help that we have uh, here at the church. Um, and so we would appreciate any help that we can get. Uh, this year we're going under the water uh, with SCUBA, um, uh, which Doc told me actually stands for something last week. What is it, Matt? Uh, Self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. Yeah, I didn't know that. I just I was like, what a fun name to name something, scuba. Um, no, apparently it actually stands for something, so the more you know. Um, but registration for VBS is also open. Um, and so, yes, we have QR code, and I think we've got even some little sheets with those back there. Um, if you don't want to use QR code, uh, you can go to our website, and I've got it nice right on the front page. It's, you, it's, it'll be hard to miss. If you go to our website, you'll see it. And you can get kiddos registered for VBS coming up this summer. Um, we are excited for that. Um, also coming up, um, we have our Easter week coming up, and so we have Good Friday service that we're going to do this year. Um, and so we, you know, we haven't done that, I don't think, as long as I've been here. Um, but Good Friday is, um, we call it Good Friday, but it's to talk about something very serious, and it's to um, deal with the fact that our Savior um, had to die for us, um, that he went to the cross uh, and he died for us. And so we want to um, gather together and worship um, on Good Friday uh, and, and spend some time uh, processing through uh, what Jesus went through for us. Um, and then um, after Friday comes Sunday. Well, there's Saturday, but come Sunday. Uh, and that's when we have Easter. And so Easter uh, is coming up uh, at the end of this month. It's really early. Uh, March 31st uh, is Easter this year. And so uh, and we will have breakfast um, starting at 9 with service at 10. There will be no Sunday school that morning. Um, but we will have 
uh, breakfast at 9, service at 10. We are excited to be able to uh, celebrate that day, and so please be inviting people to join us on Easter and Good Friday. Um, And so as we look forward to that, uh, something else that I want to talk about this morning. Um, I don't know if anybody's families ever did this. If you ever had a family meeting um, growing up where, you know, hey, let's sit down, let's talk about some stuff, let's get on the some, same page or some things that we want to, uh, to work out. Um, and we want to, to have a meeting to kind of do that with the church of, hey, let's, let's, you know, we have our annual meeting and that's good and we talk about the budget and stuff, but there's a lot of other questions, a lot of other things that we want to get to and, um, and there's just not enough time in that, that budget meeting to get through that. And so we wanted to have a meeting to sit down and talk about some different stuff. And so coming up, April 7th, it'll be the Sunday after Easter, um, we are going to have that meeting. We're going to call it our family meeting. Um, and and here's, here's what I'll say about this, right? If you ever had a family meeting um, growing up, uh, then you'll know that you're not invited to family meetings, right? You're not invited. Uh, if you're a part of the family, you'll be there. Um, and that's what I want to say about this. Uh, I, I'm not inviting you. Um, if you are a part of the family, you'll be there. Um, and so we want to talk about some stuff. Um, and figure out some things moving forward with the church. Um, I do want to give a heads up just because, I, I don't know, I feel like this question might come up. I'm not leaving. That's not what this meeting's about. <laughs> um, just, just to be really clear, I don't want to get people nervous about this. Like, we're not going anywhere. There's no staff changes taking place that we, you know. Um, this is just to talk about some different things. We want to talk about communication. We know that's something that we've struggled with. Um, and we want to get on the same page and talk about how we're going to communicate going forward. Um, I've had lots of people who you're like, man, Jed, you've got a lot going on. How can I help? Uh, at this meeting, we're going to break it down. Here's what we want to do as a church. Here's the things that we need to get started. Here's the volunteers that we need. Here are the leaders that we need. Um, we're going to walk through all of that. And then we're also uh, going to talk about some different um, uh, emphasis that we want to have in this year moving forward of some things overall as a church that we want to get better at. Um, How do we get better at doing evangelism? How do we get better at having a strong prayer life in our church? How do we get better at doing outreach in our communities? And I, I don't want this to just be a something that, you know, the elders and I sit in a room and try and figure out. We want to hear from you We want to involve you in that and let you know what's going on and what things that we are talking about. Uh, And so, you're not invited, but if you're part of the family, you'll be there. So there are sign-ups out at the on the table. I put it in between the children's sign-ups. That way, while you're there, maybe you'll sign up for some children's stuff as well. Um, But uh, you can sign up out there. Just write your name and how many with you are coming. Um, If you want um, our text message stuff, if you have signed up for our text messages, um, you should have gotten, hopefully it went through, you got a text message at 10.02. I scheduled it out, so in the middle of my announcements, you would get a text message that has the link uh, to the sign up online uh, for this. Um, And so uh, we hope to see you there. Uh, Let me pray, and then I'm going to pass it off to Matt. Uh, Dear God, I thank you for this morning. Um, I thank you uh, for the excitement um, of things to come, for spring uh, that is in the air. I heard the birds singing this morning. It was a beautiful sound, and I just pray that we can join your creation, God, in singing to you this morning. Uh, that no matter how tired we might be, no matter how late uh, we might have been up, or just how much that one hour is hitting us today, um, I pray that we will lift up our voices and praise to our God who is good and is worthy of praise. Um, God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks a ton, Jed. So even though our bodies may fail and sometimes our sleep schedules get a little wonky, his love never fails. Amen? Let's stand and sing this morning. Have some fun.
even if I ran away, your love never fails. I know I still make mistakes, but you have new mercies for me every day. Your love never fails. Whoa. open seas, your love never fails. The chasm is far too wide, I never thought I'd reach the other side, your love never fails. this week and we'll see you here in just a second.
with me this morning. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? Was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. From the sun.
this house this morning. We get to say, you are our living hope. Lord, who could imagine so great a mercy? Who could fathom such boundless grace? You are the God of ages that stepped down in glory to wear our sin and bear our shame. Lord, that we get to bear the name Jesus, that we get to wrap ourselves in his blood and live with you in eternity, Lord. And we continue to celebrate you in that this morning. It's his name we pray. Amen. Desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. The end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living
Father God, we love you this morning. We praise you that we get to say, praise the one who set me free. Lord, death has no domain here. It has no domain here, Lord. Death has no domain here. There is only life in this place. And it is because of you and your Holy Spirit that make it so. Lord, your church is not a building. Your church is inside each and every one of us who decide and declare with one voice we call you Father. Lord, heaven and earth may pass away, but you do not. And we stake our claim boldly on you today. Lord, your word in John chapter 16, 33 says, Take heart because you have overcome the world. We stake our foundation on your truth this morning, Lord. When everything seems to crumble and fall apart and there's complications and there's stress and there's worry, Lord, we seek your kingdom today. We seek your love. We seek your hope May it be so, Lord, and let your will be done in this place. And let your will be done, not in this building, Lord, but more specifically in this church. This family, Lord. This Easter season provides so many opportunities for folks to hear the beautiful news that you have completed so long ago, Lord. It is finished. We seek you this morning, Lord, and I pray it should be with Brother Jed and that you would speak through him today, Lord, about the one, the one that you call us to go and talk to. Lord, you don't call us to convince. You don't call us to try and persuade. You call us to tell. It's not up to us. We don't have any magical words, Lord. We have you, and that is good enough. We praise you this morning. It's his name we pray. Amen. You guys may be seated. Good morning. I would like to put forth a motion, first of all, to leave the clocks alone. <laughs> that, that hour seems to be more and more meaningful as you get older. It's harder to catch up. I'd like to read from the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 36 to 40. This is the uh, background is the Pharisees are testing Jesus. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. This is uh, two part. There's two parts to this. The first part is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Uh, Fifteen years ago, when I first started coming to this church, I heard this, and I, I said, oh, okay, I love the Lord with all my heart, all your soul, and with all my mind. But that's not how it works. I come to learn that it's a process that you have to grow in in your relationship with God. It's just not a switch that you turn on and off. And you have to be, uh, you have to seek out the right people and, and do the right things in order to allow your faith to grow. And this is, this is important that you, that you go through this step and, and start to make it's been 15 years, and I'm still working on it, but I've, I have come to understand 
what it means to love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And this is important because the second part is even tougher. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, we all have to admit that could be difficult with some of the neighbors. And, <laughs> and, and being humans... We're flawed, and we just can't, it's just not another switch that you flip. That you flip the switch and, okay, I love all my neighbors, and you go out and start, you know, helping people and doing things. It's not. But I came to learn that once you learn to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, it becomes much easier, much easier to love your neighbor. And it allows you to open up yourself and uh, help people and try to show them what Jesus Christ has done for them. This feast we're about to take is to celebrate Jesus Christ breaking the chains of death and saving us from sin. And this is something that, that should be carried to everyone, that we need to find that love for both our Lord and for our neighbors. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this beautiful day. I thank you for allowing us to, to freely gather here and worship you. And I ask that... that we all, we all strive to grow in our love for you so that in time we can, we can truly know what it means to love your neighbor. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. As we come in time for this offering, uh, it's the generosity of this church that allows such things that are about to come forth here in the church, the VBS and the student trips and everything else that this church does for the community and, and for uh, the area. I would like to, to thank you for your generosity because without you, this isn't possible. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask that you bless these gifts, that you, you have them given freely, and that they can go forth to be used to help this church spread the word of Jesus Christ in this community. I ask that you, you bless all the volunteers and workers that, that help with all these efforts. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. Hello again. So, is there anyone who is really good about noticing when things are different in their everyday lives? Um, you know, like, because I feel like there's two types of people. There are those who are going to notice 
every single type of change, like any small thing, they're going to, what did you do? Like, what happened? What, what, who did this? And then you have the person who is just, you know, like, it doesn't matter what change has taken place, they're not going to notice either one way or another. Um, now, I, you know, I am not the person who notices everything. It's not who I am. Um, but they are uh, some of my favorite people to mess with. Um, those are some of my favorite people to mess with. Uh, the, right? These are the people that you don't have to do anything crazy. Uh, you, right? You just shift a piece of furniture a couple inches. Um, you know, you just, you know, maybe you swap um, things around in the pantry. Maybe they've got it organized a certain way. You just swap a couple things. Uh, you know, turn the, the toilet paper roll the opposite direction. Right? I could just hear someone screaming in the bathroom now. Who did this? <laughs> yes, exactly. Right? It's the simple it's changes that can just drive these people insane. Um, uh, you know, especially when they have like no idea who is doing it. Um, when I um, worked at camp, uh, camp stories, oh my goodness. Um, I'll, I have all the camp stories. Um, uh, there was a girl who, she was on staff with me, and she had gone away for the weekend, and um, we all had, like, padlocks on our room so people couldn't mess with our stuff and whatnot. Well, the padlock, it, it was just, you know, like, the thing that holds a padlock is just screwed to the wall. Um, and so she was gone, and I just took a screwdriver and unscrewed those screws. The door swings open. <laughs> I, I didn't do anything crazy. I moved her pillow to the opposite side of the bed. And then I put the, everything back up and walked away. And like the whole rest of the summer, it was driving like someone was in my room. It was padlocked, what are you talking about? No, someone was in my room. And it was just like she was freaking out. And so uh, I do, I love to mess with those people. Now on the opposite side of the spectrum, you know, you have those of us who notice absolutely nothing. Um, and, and there's an equally fun game to play with these people is to see how far you can push them not noticing. Um, and, right, this is about making gradually larger changes, right? Start with something like moving the coffee maker to a different part of the kitchen. Um, start simple, right? Change the background picture on their phone to something else. See if they notice. Uh, and then you can start doing something a little bit more, uh, right? They're still not noticing, okay? Take some of their favorite items of clothing that they wear on a regular basis and just hide it from their drawer, right? So they can't find it. And, and just see if they notice that that, you know, that shirt that they love is gone. Uh, just see if they notice that. Um, some other things, you know, maybe you, you start to get a little bit more, right? Maybe let's rearrange the layout of a room, uh, see if they pick up on that. Um, and then if, like, if things are still going well, this is where you get to have a lot of fun, um, right? It, and it, you have to be dedicated now. You got to be dedicated, uh, right? Maybe like hang up some like random large pictures in the house that you like, you know, you find at the Goodwill or something, see if they notice that just all of a sudden, where do they like, you know, do they notice the giant picture of a clown on the wall? Um, right? Like, let's, let's paint a room a different color while they're gone one day. Like, are they going to pick up on the fact that this took place? Um, and then now again, this is, this is only for the dedicated, okay? This is only for those who have the guts to pull it off, right? Go trade in the car, get a different one, and see, you know, are you going to notice that we have a different car? Now, I, I do want to make it clear, I am not held responsible for any relational damage that comes from you doing these things. You know, don't take and trade in your car and be like, well, the pastor told me to do it. No, no, no. Um, I will deny it. I'll go back. I'll delete the live stream. There's going to be no internet evidence. Um, you know, but all of this to say, right, there are some people who are good at noticing things in their life, um, and there are those of us who just are not. Um, and, you know, I, there's, it depends with me. Sometimes there's some things that I'll notice, but, like, I'm, like, the classic husband um, that, you know, I'm not going to notice if Sammy gets a haircut. Like, I'm sorry. Like, I just, it's going to, I'm going to miss it. Um, there's random things like that. Um, you know, there's some times where Sammy's like, hey, where's Remy? Oh, man. <laughs> like, where did he go? Like, that's crazy. Uh, I could have sworn he was right here. Um, and so, you know, it, it happens. 
Um, but what we notice matters a lot, and we're going to talk about that today. Uh, we're going to continue to look at the parables in Luke 15. We started this new series last Sunday, and it's going to carry us through Easter. Um, and last week, we talked about the value of the one. Uh, each of these parables has a missing item, uh, whether it's a sheep, a coin, or a son. There's a missing item. And so last week, we talked about the value of the one. Because you see, the Pharisees uh, were treating the tax collectors and the sinners as if they were acceptable losses. Right? Like, oh, this is gone. That's okay. It's gone. We'll just write it off. It'll be fine. But God is always going to care when one from his flock goes missing. There's no acceptable losses in the eyes of God. And so last week we read about God's desire for all to come to repentance and faith. And at the end of the sermon, um, I encourage everyone to take three days this last week to read the different parables and pray a specific prayer um, uh, on each of the days to pray that God would help us have a deeper understanding of the value of the one. Right? Because God loves everyone, and that he is the one that we are going to learn that from. How can I care for the one? I need to learn it from God. Let me pray to God and, and help, uh, ask that he help me in that. And so I, I hope that that was a valuable time for you in this week. Um, and I also hope that now you're ready for what comes next, because today is about identifying who the one might be in our life that God wants us to find. So before we dig into that idea more, let's read through one of the parables in Luke 15. So if you want, you can turn with me to Luke 15. We're going to read that second parable of the woman who lost her coin. So uh, we're going to start in verse 8. Luke 15, verse 8, and it says, Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin in the same way I tell you. There is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. Um, now, as a guy uh, who always, you know, I've talked about my everyday carry things that I always have in my pockets. Um, there's a ref reflex that I have developed anytime we go anywhere, and maybe some guys can relate to this. Right, if we go out to eat at a restaurant and we're getting up to ready to leave, right, I slide out of the booth, I always do the, the three slap check, um, right? I gotta smack my front right pocket, make sure my phone's there. I gotta smack my front left pocket to make sure my keys are there. And then I smack my back left pocket to make sure my wallet's there, right? Anytime I get up to go to leave anywhere, boom, 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 okay, we're ready to go. Let's, let's you know, it's just quick. I don't even like, it's not even something that like I think about anymore. It's just something I do, like I get up, okay, I got everything, let's go. We're ready to roll. Um, and, and, and you know, the reason for this uh, is because, you know, growing up, um, I didn't wear, like, jeans as much. You know, a lot of times, if it was nice out, right, I'm wearing, um, like, gym shorts um, out and around. And I don't know if you've ever worn gym shorts. They don't hold things in pockets well at all. And so I had a problem of, like, losing my wallet out of gym shorts or losing money or, you know, my phone or whatever. Um, you know, I remember one time I was young, and we had gone up to Sioux Falls for the Life Light Festival um, you know, I don't know if you were there back in the day. Um, big festival, lots of stuff going on. Um, and my mom had given me $20 to go spend at the different vendors that they had. Well, the basketball shorts, like the gym shorts that I had on, didn't have any pockets that day. I was like, shoot. So I shoved the 20 down the side of my sock. I was like, I'll, it'll be fine. Um, it's not going to be fine. Um, Right, like not even an hour had gone by and I'm at this vendor, I wanted to buy something and now they're staring at this weird kid who's down pulling off his shoe and his sock to try and empty it out, flip it around as he looks for a $20 bill because at some point in walking around, it had worked its way up out of my sock and I had no idea. <laughs> uh, and so, but if you've been there, you know how like that feeling in your heart that you get when you realize that something is lost. Right, if you lose your wallet, that sinking feeling that you get of like, oh no, like, man, that is awful. And, and so I, you know, I think about this woman, 
this woman in this parable. She's got 10 silver coins. Now, these were Greek drachmas, uh, which is probably the equivalent to a day's labor. Okay? Each coin was equivalent to a day's labor. And, and what the parable seems to be suggesting is that these coins were everything the woman has. She's got 10 days worth of money. 10 days, 10 coins. How horrifying of a moment to look and realize that one is missing. Like, oh, man. And, and, you know, and so it talks about her, you know, she starts searching the house for this coin. And, and it's not like searching a house today, right? We've got these like 5,000 lumen daylight bulbs that, you know, illuminate our indoors better than what it's illuminated outside. Um, you know, like my brother loves um, flashlights and whatnot, so he like bought like the brightest flashlight ever on Amazon, and it like instantly blinds you and stuff, you know, um, right? Like we have this stuff to help us find things. Um, that, that wasn't the case, right? Uh, they closed in homes, not a lot of light, right? She's got a lamp. I don't know if you've ever tried to find anything by the light of a small flame, uh, especially when you're trying to, like, you kind of look on the floor. You can't tip a lamp that well, um, right? This is going to be so hard. And then to make matters worse, um, you know, like, you have carpet. We've got hardwood floors. Uh, we got nice flooring that things sit on top of, right? This woman probably has a dirt floor, She's got a dirt floor. This coin's getting covered in dust. Maybe, depending, it could be even getting, like, worked into the floor. Like, this is not going to be an easy thing to find. But she knows the value of this coin. And so she does everything necessary until she can find it. So as I mentioned, the, the big question for this morning is how do we identify the one in our life that we need to seek out and find? Well, I wanted to focus on this second parable for a little bit this morning because it's easier to see the blaring reason of how we make this decision. How did the lady know what coin to look for? Right? It seems like a dumb question because it's so simple. But that's kind of the point, right? It doesn't say where she kept her coins, but let's say she had, you know, a little coin purse. She needed some money. She went to open it. You know, it doesn't take much to count to 10 and realize one's not here. How does she know what coin to look for? It's the one that's not there. It's the one that's missing, and this is easy to visualize for ourselves today. You guys came in today. Uh, you chose a seat. Your, friend, your friends, your family came in. They chose a seat. Maybe someone you didn't know came in. They chose a seat. But look around this morning. What do you notice about our room? There's a lot of empty seats. There's people missing. And, and this isn't a shot at our church. I'm not trying to be like, you know, our church is doing terrible or anything like that. I'm just trying to point out it's easy to see who we need to find. It's the person who's not here. It's the person that's missing. And this is why we start talking about the value of the one. Why did the shepherd even notice that one was missing, right? If I have a hundred sheep running around, it's probably difficult to count sheep when they're just out in a pasture running around, right? He's got to have a system set up to count his sheep, to have a regular count to notice, oh man, I'm missing one. But why does he set up a system in the first place? Because those sheep are valuable to him, right? I'm not going to take the time to count things frequently if there's no value, but he does because there is value to that sheep. There is value to the coins that the, the woman had lost, our value of the individual is what's going to open our eyes to see who is missing, right? If we don't value the one, we're not going to feel like anything's missing on a Sunday morning. We're going to come in, we're going to sing our songs, we're going to listen to our message, we're going to go home, and that's it. That's great. It was a good service. But if we understand the value of the one, we're going to see an empty seat. Man, who should have been there? Who should have been in that seat? 
And it's also more than just who's missing. You know, some people have vacations. You know, you know, it's shame on you for missing a Sunday of church. I'm not trying to shame anybody for going on vacation or anything of that sort. Um, but if you remember last week, we talked about the two different groups of people gathering to listen to Jesus, the Pharisees and the sinners. Now, this is not the first time that Jesus has had a run-in on finding himself in the company of these two groups. Uh, there is actually a time earlier in the book of Luke where he, we find Jesus in a similar situation. It's in Luke chapter 5. Jesus is calling his disciples to follow, them, follow him, and one of them that he has gone to the house to call is the tax collector, Levi. Now, if you remember, the tax collectors belong to what group? The sinners. They were not the, the yay, here's a tax collector, people. <laughs> He grouped them with the sinners, and so in chapter 5, the Pharisees are not happy that Jesus is eating with sinners, let alone using them to be his disciples. But let me read uh, in Luke chapter 5, verse 30 through 32. This is what it says. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, who belonged to their sect, complained to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. When we are trying to identify who the one is that's missing, who do I need to find to fill this seat? Right? The answer is, is probably not a righteous person. Righteous people find their place where they need to be. It's a person who needs to know Jesus. It's a person who needs to repent of their sin. It's a person who needs to be found, not because they are just not here, because they need to find God themselves. The righteous are considered part of the 99, right? They're considered part of the nine coins. It's, all right, it's still in the bag. And, and for some reason, when it comes to the 99 sheep, there's sometimes confusion um, that comes through in studying that parable. Um, and I think it stems from verse 7 of the chapter, and I want to read this. Uh, it says, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not, or who do, do not need to repent. Right? Some people take that verse uh, and they read it as, Jesus cares more about the one than the 99. That, that, they, try to, they read that and they try to say, well, yeah, Jesus cares more about the one than the 99. And I, I don't think that's what Jesus is getting at at all. Right? Imagine, I want uh, you to think of a scenario with me, and I apologize. This is um, a, a hard scenario. Okay? It's a parent's worst nightmare. A child has been involved in some sort of accident. It's a serious accident. They've been life flighted to a hospital. They're, this child is in critical condition. It's life or death, and the parents have no idea if this child's even going to make it through the night. What is going to be the natural response of the parents when they hear this news? They're going to drop everything. They're going to rush to the hospital and be with their child, right? Like, that's what I'm doing. I don't care what's going on. I'm gone. I'm going to the hospital. I'm going to be with my child. And on the way, right, they drop off the other siblings at a grandparent's house, but, right, the priority is to get to the one who's in the hospital. Do they care less about their children who are healthy and safe than the one who's in the hospital? No. No. Absolutely not. Let me, let me continue this a little bit. Um, by what can only be considered a miracle, the child in the hospital makes full recovery. The next morning, the child is in a stable condition and the threat of death has subsided. It's a miracle. It's amazing. 
After a week, the child is discharged and able to return home, and the parents now have a full group of healthy children once again. And they decide to throw a party. Whose health are they going to celebrate? Should we deem them as bad parents for celebrating the health of their child who almost died over the ones who were healthy the whole time? Right? We wouldn't do that. We would never do that. Why are we able to make that rational conclusion? Because we understand the scenario. We understand what is going on with the parents. Everything changes when the stakes are life or death. Right? How much more disdain would we, ha- would we give these parents if they acted nonchalantly about having a child in the hospital? Well, we'll go see them eventually, but you know, we want to make sure that we're giving every child equal treatment, so we're going to spend some ch- time with our children here, and then we'll go see them Right, this would blow our minds. We'd be like, what are you talking about? Go be with your child in the hospital. Why does heaven rejoice more over one sinner who repents, over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent? Because a child of God was in a life or death situation. That's why. The situation was critical, but then they were saved from death. And and that's not exaggeratory. That is literally what took place. They were saved from death. When a lost child of God is found, it is them being saved from death. And we see this in the end of the last parable with the prodigal son. Right? The other brother gets upset, and we'll talk about this more in a later message, but the the brother gets upset when, when the The prodigal son comes back home and he's like, well, where's my party? Where's my fattened calf? Right, and this is what the father says in verse 32. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Jesus cares for and loves the 99 They are precious to him. Do not ever feel that you are not precious to Jesus. But God has children who are not safe. God has children who are in a life or death scenario, who are lost and need to be found. And God has asked us to help him bring his children home. And we know that this is in reference to those who are not here, uh, those who need to know the hope that we have in Jesus. We also know that this is life or death. There is an urgency in which we need to accomplish this. And there's one last practical way that I want to talk about this morning of choosing a one um, that I want to talk about. How do we choose that one? I have one more practical way that I want us to talk about this. So we have a dog in our house, a little corgi named Cheddar. And she's a pretty good dog, other than a couple things that drive me nuts. Um, One of these things is that she'll decide to follow you around the house. And many times, corgis are herders, and so sometimes, like, she'll try and herd you. She'll, like, nip at your heel to get you to go to a certain direction, which drives me nuts. Um, But even more than that, um, a lot of times she doesn't want to walk behind you. She wants to walk right in front of you. And, I, like, there's times where, like, I'm trying to get stuff done. Like, I need to get the house clean. I told Sammy I was going to do a bunch of stuff, and I didn't. And now I got a couple minutes before she's home. I'm like, I got like, to clean. I got to get stuff done, right? And I'm trying to hurry around the home, and I've got this dog who keeps getting in my way. It's walking right in my path. Every time I turn a corner, she's standing there right where I need to go. And it's like, get out of my way. And so, you know, it's just, it drives me nuts. And it's enough to where, like, I'm almost to fall over this dog because she keeps getting in my way. And, and then, I, like, I finally yell at her, like, get, move. And, and she, like, looks at me like, what? What did I do? What? But, you know, when I was younger, there was a kid at camp, camp stories, all the camp stories, sorry. Um, and he caused quite a bit of issues. 
Um, you know, he, he had struggles, to put it nicely. Um, you know, he got sent home from camp several of the years that he was there. Um, and not only did it seem that we would end up at the same week of camp, every year. But at camp, we often break into family groups for the week in which, you know, we have a smaller group that we get to know and do stuff with. Um, Every year, it seemed I was in this guy's family group. And it drove me insane. And I remember I was, you know, my mom came and picked me up. We're driving home. uh, And, you know, I start off, well, you'll never guess who was in my group again. And then she asked me this question. She said, what if it's not a coincidence? What if it's not a coincidence that he's in your group, Jed? What if God is putting him in your group because he needs someone like you in his life? You know, moms have that way of taking something that you're annoyed about and then throwing it back in your face and making you feel like a terrible person. (laughs) but that always stuck out to me. What if the people that end up in our path frequently during our life are not there by accident? What if God placed them there because they need someone like you in their life? You know, last week I wanted you to pray about growing and understanding about the value of the one. This week, I want you to spend some time processing who that person is might be? Who is that one that I need to go find? And here are the three things from this morning that I want you to consider in this process. Firstly and simply, who's not here? Who's not here? It's, it's, got, it's gonna be someone who isn't here. Who needs to be sitting in that empty seat beside you? Next, it's not going to be someone who already has an active relationship with Jesus. Those people aren't lost. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Jesus did not come to call the righteous, but to call sinners to repentance. And so we need to seek someone who needs to find repentance, who needs to be saved from that life or death scenario. But lastly, what I want you to consider and think about this, is who might have God put intentionally in your path? Who is that person that it's like, man, I bump into this person a lot. (laughs) Is that a coincidence? A simple way to help figure this out (laughs) is to ask God, God, is this a coincidence? (laughs) And so again, I I don't want this to be something where you just pick a name out of the air. I want it to be something that you think about, process, and spend time in prayer over. Because we're not just going out to do stuff. We're going out to partner with God. Right? God doesn't place people in our path by accident. It's not a coincidence. God is saying, help me do something that I'm already working on. I'm trying to work on this person. Can you help me along the way? I'm going to put them in your path. Can you help me? So spend some time praying about this. And what I want you to do is on your way out, I'm going to be at the door and I'm going to have some bookmarks. There are going to be some bookmarks. You might have seen them back in the corner already. Um, Just a simple bookmark. Uh, And one of the things it says on there is, who's your one? And that little part is uh, perforated so you can tear it off And that's where I want you, during this week, to pray over that card and figure out what name needs to be on that. Figure it out and write that person's name down. And then you can keep that little card and you can place it somewhere that you're going to see every day. You know, maybe it's a mirror in the bathroom, maybe it's in your car, wherever it might be, so that you can know, I have someone in my life that I need to find. I need them to, I need to help them find Jesus. The other part of this card um, is, is some uh, passages of scripture. It's got 30 days worth of scriptures. 
um, in which it talks, it'll help you process what do I need to do for the one, some passages to pray over um, about finding our one. And, and actually next week what we're gonna do um, is next week we're talking about praying, we're talking about praying for our one. And so I'm gonna have some uh, prayer guides next week to give out. Um, and so just know that those 30 days of um, uh, Bible verses that are going to be on this card um, are going to be in this prayer guide next week as well. Um, but, man, who do we need to find? It's simple. The one who's missing. And I pray that that's something that you take seriously. That you understand the value of that one. You know, I do hope that you come and you enjoy the service and that it is a blessing to you, but I also pray that you come and you sit here on a Sunday morning and you realize, man, we've got room for more. And that's the amazing thing about God's table. It's not going to run out of room anytime soon. Even if we fill these seats, we'll find room for more. But it starts with one. It starts with one. Pray with me. Dear God, man, it is, it is a life or death scenario for those who are lost. And I know that you are a loving father. You are a loving father who cares for each and every one of us, but there is an added priority and urgency to those who are not here. And I pray that we understand that. It does not detract from your love for us. But I pray that we take on that urgency ourselves. That we take on that seriousness of the situation. Because God, there are people that you have placed in our lives. People who bump into us in our daily lives and you're saying, hey Jed, I need you to seek this person. I need you to pray for this person. I need you to help them find me. God, I pray that we can do that. that we will pray this week over this card, God, whose name do I need to write down? What person are you calling me to seek after? How can I show them the love and the grace that I have been given through your son? So God, help us this week. Help us wrestle with that. It's in your son's name that I pray. Amen. Will you stand with me as we close out our final song this morning? Lord, I
is Christ in me. You're my hope and stay. an honor to be able to worship with you this morning. Think of your one this week. Think of that one person that you know that there's something that just stirs your heart. You're never going to lose out if they say no. That's the worst they can do. There's nothing wrong with being rejected, but there is something wrong with not starting the conversation. I just want to encourage you to think of your one this week, just as Jed has. If this is your first time here and you have questions, you want some love, you want, you want a hug, you want to hang out for a quick minute in the back in the sanctuary, Jed and I will be back there. We want to just give you some love and encouragement this week. You guys are dismissed. We'll see you in one week.